From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the 177th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church, and music for this session by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Communications. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President of the Church will conduct this session. We welcome you this morning to the fourth general session of the 177th semi-annual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We extend our greetings to those of you who are participating by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. We are grateful to the owners and operators of the public broadcast facilities who are making this conference available. We acknowledge the presence this morning of government, education, and civic leaders who are with us. The music for this session will be by the Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Craig Jessup and Mac Wilberg with Clay Christiansen and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir opened this session by singing, Guide us, O Thou Great Jehovah, and will now favor us with, O oh, Thou kind and gracious Father. The invocation will then be offered by Elder W. Rolf Kerr, an emeritus member of the Seventy.
Our Father in heaven, we come before thee with thankful hearts. We give thee thanks for the life and sacrifice of thy Son, our Savior and Redeemer. We're thankful for the restoration of the gospel in these latter days, for its meaning in our lives. We give thee thanks for living prophets, seers, and revelators. We're thankful, Father, that the life and service of President Hinckley has been prolonged. And we pray that his life will be further extended and that he will be strengthened physically, that the quickness of his mind and the power of his spirit might be sustained. We pray for the members of the Church around the world that we might all be valiant in the testimony of Jesus. We pray for the troubled places of the world where conflict exists and ask thy blessing upon those who are in positions to make a difference, that hearts might be softened and that peace might be restored. We would ask for a special blessing upon the uninformed, even the antagonist, that the message of this conference will be understood and that there will be a sense of acceptance and understanding. We pray particularly, Father, for the honest in heart, that they may receive a witness of thy spirit and come to understand and know the truthfulness of the restored gospel of thy Son. We now pray for blessings upon all that transpires in this session of conference, that millions of lives will be blessed and strengthened thereby. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
The choir just sang a child's prayer. We will now be pleased to hear from President Henry B. Eyring, newly sustained second counselor in the presidency. Following his remarks, we shall hear from Elder Quentin L. Cook, sustained yesterday morning as a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. We shall then be pleased to hear from Elder Claudio R. M. Costa of the Presidency of the Seventy and Sister Julie B. Beck, Relief Society General President. After Sister Beck, the choir and congregation will sing, I am a child of God. Elder Christopher Golden, Jr. of the Seventy will then address us, after which we shall hear from Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. I was grateful for the choir and their broadcast this morning, which was about the Savior, and grateful to see that one of the songs they sang, This is the Christ, the words were written by President James E. Faust. As I sat down to, next to Brother Newell, I leaned over to him and asked, uh, how are your children? He said that, well, when President Faust sat in that chair, that's what he always asked. <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised uh, because uh, President Faust was always uh, the perfect example of the disciple that was described in the spoken word today. I always felt that uh, when I grew up, I wanted to be like President Faust. There may still be time. <laughs> when our children were very small, I started to write down a few things about what happened every day. Let me tell you how that got started. I com came home late from a church assignment. It was after dark. My father-in-law, who lived near us, surprised me as I walked toward the door, the front door of my house. He was carrying a load of pipes over his shoulder, walking very fast, and dressed in his work clothes. I knew that he had been building a system to pump water from a stream below us up to our property. He smiled, spoke softly, and then rushed past me into the darkness to go on with his work. I took a few steps towards the house, thinking of what he was doing for us. And just as I got to the door, I heard in my mind, not in my own voice, these words, I'm not giving you these experiences for yourself. Write them down. I went inside. I didn't go to bed. Although I was tired, I took out some paper and began to write. And as I did, I understood the message I had heard in my mind. I was supposed to record for my children to read someday in the future how I had seen the hand of God blessing our family. Grandpa didn't have to do what he was doing for us. He could have had someone else do it or not done it at all. But he was serving us, his family, in the way covenant disciples of Jesus Christ always do. I knew that was true, and so I wrote it down so that my children could have the memory someday when they would need it. I wrote down a few lines every day for years. I never missed a day, no matter how tired I was or how early I would have to start the next day. Before I would write, I would ponder this question. Have I seen the hand of God reaching out to touch us or our children or our family today? As I kept at it, something began to happen. As I would cast my mind over the day, I would see evidence of what God had done for one of us that I had not recognized in the busy moments of the day. As that happened, and it happened often, I realized that trying to remember had allowed God to show me what He had done. More than gratitude began to grow in my heart. Testimony grew. I became ever more certain that our Heavenly Father hears and answers prayers. I felt more gratitude for the softening and refining that come 
because of the Atonement of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And I grew more confident that the Holy Ghost can bring all things to our remembrance, even things we did not notice or pay attention to when they happened. The years have gone by. My boys are grown men. And now and then one of them will surprise me by saying, Dad, I was reading in my copy of the journal about when. And then he will tell me about how reading of what happened so long ago helped him notice something God had done in his day that day. My point to you is to urge you to find ways to recognize and remember God's kindness. It will build our testimonies. You may not keep a journal. You may not share whatever record you keep with those you love and serve. But you and they will be blessed as you remember what the Lord has done. You remember that song we sometimes sing, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. It won't be easy to remember. Living as we do with a veil over our eyes, we cannot remember what it was like to be with our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in the premortal world. Nor can we see with our physical eyes or with reason alone the hand of God in our lives in life. Seeing such things takes the Holy Ghost, and it is not easy to be worthy of the Holy Ghost companionship in a wicked world. That is why forgetting God has been such a persistent problem among His children since the world began. Think of the times of Moses, when God provided manna and in miraculous and visible ways led and protected His children. Still, the prophet warned the people who had been so blessed as prophets always have warned and always will. Take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. And the challenge to remember has always been the hardest for those who are blessed abundantly. Those who are faithful to God are protected and prospered. That comes as the result of serving God and keeping His commandments. But with those blessings come the temptation to forget their source. It is easy to begin to feel the blessings were granted not by a loving God on whom we depend, but by our own powers. The prophets have repeated this lament over and over. And thus we can behold how false and also the unsteadiness of the hearts of the children of men. Yea, we can see that the Lord in His great infinite goodness doth bless and prosper those who put their trust in Him. Yea, and we may see at the very time when He doth prosper His people, yea, in the increase of their fields, their flocks, and their herds, and in gold and in silver, and in all manner of precious things of every kind and art, sparing their lives and delivering them out of the hands of their enemies, softening the hearts of their enemies that they should not declare war against them, yea, and in fine, doing all things for the welfare and happiness of His children, yea, then is the time they do harden their hearts and do forget the Lord their God and do trample under their feet the Holy One, yea, and this because of their ease and their exceedingly great prosperity. And the prophet goes on to say, yea, how quick to be lifted up in pride, yea, how quick to boast and do all manner of that which is iniquity, and how slow are they to remember the Lord their God and give ear unto His counsels, yea, how slow to walk in wisdom's path. Sadly, prosperity is not the only reason people forget God. It can also be hard to remember Him when our lives go badly, when we struggle, as so many do, in grinding poverty, or when our enemies prevail against us, or when sickness is not healed. The enemy of our souls can send his evil message that there is no God or that if he exists, he does not care about us. Then it can be hard for the Holy Ghost to bring to our remembrance the lifetime of blessings the Lord has given us from our infancy and in the midst of our distress. There is a simple cure for the terrible malady of forgetting God, His blessings, and His messages to us. 
Jesus Christ promised it to his disciples when he was about to be crucified, resurrected, and then taken away from them to ascend in glory to his Father. They were concerned to know how they would be able to endure when he was no longer with them. Here is the promise. It was fulfilled for them then. It can be fulfilled for all of us now. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the, cover, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The key to the remembering that brings and maintains testimony is receiving the Holy Ghost as a companion. It is the Holy Ghost who helps us see what God has done for us. It is the Holy Ghost who can help those we serve to see what God has done for them. Heavenly Father has given a simple pattern for us to receive the Holy Ghost, not once, but continually in the tumult of our daily lives. The pattern is repeated in the sacramental prayer. We promise that we will always remember the Savior. We promise to take his name upon us. We promise to keep his commandments. And we are promised that if we will have, that if we do that, we will have his spirit to be with us. Those promises work together in a wonderful way to strengthen our testimonies and in time through the atonement to change our natures as we keep our part of the promise. It is the Holy Ghost who testifies that Jesus Christ is the beloved Son of a heavenly Father who loves us and wants us to have eternal life with him in families. With even the beginning of that testimony, we feel a desire to keep, to serve him and to keep his commandments. When we persist in doing that, we receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost to give us power in our service. We come to see the hand of God more clearly, so clearly that in time we not only remember him, but we come to love him and through the power of the atonement become more like him. You might ask, but how does this process get started in someone who knows nothing about God and claims no memory of spiritual experiences at all? Everyone has had spiritual experiences that they may not have recognized. Every person upon entering the world is given the Spirit of Christ. How that Spirit works is described in the book of Moroni. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I show unto you the way to judge for everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of God. But so what, whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do evil and believe not in Christ and deny him and serve not God, then ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of the devil. For after this manner doth he the devil work, for he persuadeth no man to do good, no, not one. Neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves unto him. Wherefore, I beseech of you, brethren, that ye search diligently in the light of Christ, that ye may know good from evil. And if you will lay hold upon every good thing and condemn it not, ye certainly will be a child of Christ. So even before people receive the rights to the gifts of the Holy Ghost when they are confirmed as members of the Church, and even before the Holy Ghost confirms truth to them before baptism, they have spiritual experiences. The Spirit of Christ has already from their childhood invited them to do good and warned them against evil. They have memories of those experiences, even if they have not recognized their source that memory will come back to them as missionaries or we teach them the word of God and they hear it. They will remember the feeling of joy or sorrow when they are taught the truths of the gospel. And that memory of the Spirit of Christ will soften their hearts to allow the Holy Ghost to testify to them. That will lead them to keep commandments and want to take the name of the Savior upon them. And when they do, and as they hear the words, in confirmation, receive the Holy Ghost, spoken by an authorized servant of God, the power to always remember God will be increased. 
I testify to you that the warm feelings you have had as you have listened to truth being spoken in this conference are from the Holy Ghost. The Savior who promised that the Holy Ghost would come is the beloved, glorified Son of our Heavenly Father. Tonight and tomorrow night, you might pray and ponder, asking the question, did God send a message that was just for me? Did I see his hand in my life or the life of my children? I will do that, and then I will find a way to preserve that memory for the day that I and those that I love will need to remember how much God loves us and how much we need him. I testify that he loves us and blesses us more than most of us have yet recognized. I know that is true, and it brings me joy to remember him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dear brothers and sisters, I join with you in expressing my love and sustaining support to President Eyring and his family. President Hinckley extended this call to serve in the Quorum of the Twelve late Thursday afternoon. I cannot possibly articulate the kaleidoscope of feelings I have experienced since then. There have been sleepless nights and much prayer. My spirits have been buoyed, however, by the knowledge that President Hinckley is the prophet and that the membership of the Church will be praying for me and my family. To say that I feel deeply inadequate would be an understatement. When I was called as a general authority in April of 1996, I also felt unequal to that calling. Elder Maxwell reassured me then that the most important qualification for all of us serving in the kingdom is to be comfortable in bearing witness of the divinity of the Savior. A peace came over me at that time and has stayed with me since because I love the Savior and have had spiritual experiences that allow me to testify of Him. I rejoice in the opportunity to bear witness of Jesus Christ in all the world notwithstanding my inadequacies. In Doctrine and Covenants 68, verses 5 and 6, we, re we read, Behold, this is the promise of the Lord unto you, O ye my servants. Wherefore, be of good cheer, and do not fear. For I, the Lord, am with you, and will stand by you, and ye shall bear record of me, even Jesus Christ that I am the Son of the living God, that I was, that I am, and that I am to come. I seek the companionship of the Holy Ghost as I speak with you this Sabbath morning. The overwhelming feeling that I have in receiving this call is that we must live by faith and not by fear. In 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul references the faith of Timothy's grandmother, Lois and his mother Eunice. Paul writes, for, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In my, in my own case, I respectfully acknowledge ancestors now on the other side of the veil who gave everything asked of them to build the kingdom of God upon the earth. I am grateful that all my life I have been surrounded by those who love the Savior. My heart is full of appreciation for my family. My wife, Mary, has been the joy of my life. Her spiritual strength, righteous example, sense of humor, and loving support have blessed me throughout my life. Our three children and their spouses have been a source of great personal satisfaction and together with our nine grandchildren have been such a blessing to us. Their faith and prayers and the goodness of their lives have been a great comfort to Mary and me. When I think back to my youth 
in Logan, Utah, Elder Perry's fabled Cache Valley, I realized how fortunate I was to be reared in a goodly home, to have a righteous mother who was full of faith and a loving father, an older brother who has been an extraordinary example to me as well as a friend and counselor, and a younger sister who has been loving and supportive. How fortunate also to have, to have had talented and devoted Church leaders, teachers, coaches, and friends who are wonderful examples to me. As a young man, I had the opportunity to serve in the British Mission, which was a seminal of defining event in my life. The influence of a valiant mission president is one of the great miracles of the restored gospel. A few weeks ago, I received a birthday card at Church headquarters from a woman I helped teach in Gloucester, England many years ago. I had lost contact with her. She informed me that she and her husband are both very active members, have six children and 20 grandchildren, all born in the covenant. It may be the best birthday card I have ever received. Mary and I left Utah so I could attend law school in Palo Alto, California. We were planning to return to Utah after graduation, but the Spirit directed that we stay in California. We lived in California for 33 years and raised our family there. We both had many opportunities to serve. We loved the diversity of the members and their commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will be eternally grateful for the wonderful Latter-day Saints in California who have been such a positive influence in my life. These last eleven and a half years of service as a Seventy have been truly rewarding ones. As I leave the Quorum, I want my fellow brethren to know of my love and appreciation for their dedication and loyalty to the kingdom of God on the earth, for their faithfulness and good works. I want them to know of the joy it has been to serve with them. I love the brethren we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators with all my heart. I've tried to serve honorably and lighten their responsibilities in any way I could. I'm grateful to the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve for their lives of goodness and example, their patience, their teaching, their kindness, their devotion to our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ and His restored gospel. I am grateful that God called Joseph Smith to be a prophet through whom the fullness of the gospels was restored to earth. My experience as a general authority has filled my heart with appreciation for the faith and goodness of the Latter-day Saints all over the world. We served for two years in the Philippines. In April of 1961, President Hinckley, then in the Quorum of the Twelve, sent the first missionaries to Manila. There was only one Filipino priesthood holder in the Philippines. Today there are almost 600,000 members. Their lives are not easy, and they lack many material things, but they love the Savior. The gospel is having a tremendous impact in improving their lives. What a blessing to serve in their midst. We also served for three years in the Pacific Islands. It is significant that almost 25 percent of all the Polynesians in the world are members of the Church. Their faith and spirituality are legendary. Sister Cook and I were in Vavau in the Tongan Islands on one occasion. I had just spoken about following the prophet in the general session of state conference. At the luncheon following the conference, I sat next to a distinguished elderly patriarch. He indicated how grateful he was to hear what the prophet was teaching. He gave me the following account. Bavau, which is a relatively small island, usually has sufficient rain, but periodically there are severe droughts. The island has long inlets or bays, almost like sounds, which curl into the island below steep hills. When drought conditions left the village without water, there was only one way they could obtain fresh water and stay alive. Over the centuries, they had found that fresh water traveled down through rock formations inside the mountains and came up in a few spots in the sea. The Tongan men would set off in their small boats with the wise elder standing at one end of the boat 
looking for just the right spot. The strong young man in the boat stood ready with containers to dive deep into the seawater. When they reached the appropriate spot, the wise man would raise both arms to heaven. That was the signal. The strong young men would dive off the boat as deep as they could and fill the containers with fresh spring water. This old patriarch likened this life-saving tradition to the living waters of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the wise man to God's prophet here on earth. He noted that the water was pure, fresh, and in their drought condition, life-saving, but it was not easy to find. It was not visible to the untrained eye. This patriarch wanted to know everything the prophet was teaching. We live in a precarious time. The world is in desperate need of the fresh spring water, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should listen intently to the prophet as we make choices. My own informal record indicate that President Hinckley has continually emphasized faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That has been followed by his emphasis on strengthening families and having family religious observance in the home. Over and over again, he has told us that if we would live a principle, we would gain a testimony of the truthfulness of that principle, which would in turn increase our faith. I know that many of you are concerned about raising your children during these difficult times and increasing their faith. When my wife and I were starting our family in the San Francisco Bay Area, we had that same concern. At a critical point, our stake members were advised by Elder Harold B. Lee, then a member of the Twelve, that we could raise our families in righteousness if we would, one, follow the prophet, two, create the true spirit of the gospel in our hearts and homes, three, be a light to those among whom we live, and four, focus on the ordinances and principles taught in the temple. As we followed this counsel, our faith increased and our fears decreased. I believe we can raise righteous children anywhere in the world if they are taught religious principles in the home. One area where members can live by faith and not by fear is in our missionary effort. Prior to my call to the seven presidents on August 1st of this year, I had served in the missionary department for six years the last three years as executive director under Elder M. Russell Ballard, who served as chairman of the Missionary Executive Council. Some mission presidents informed us that many wonderful members are in camouflage to their neighbors and co-workers. They do not let people know who they are and what they believe. We need much more member involvement, involvement in sharing the message of the Restoration. Romans 10, verse 14 puts this into perspective. How then shall they call on Him, speaking of the Savior, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15 contains the wonderful me message referenced in Isaiah. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. It has been observed that the members are going to have to move their feet and let their voice be heard if they are to achieve this blessing. Preach My Gospel, a guide to missionary service, was first introduced in October 2004. President Hinckley commenced this effort when he called for missionaries to learn the doctrine and to teach the principles by the Spirit. Every member of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve participated to a significant degree. Elder Ballard and I felt that the windows of heaven were opened and the Lord's inspiration poured out to bring forth this great resource. Over 1.5 million copies of Preach My Gospel have been acquired by the members of the Church. It is a wonderful foundation, and the missionaries are powerful spiritual teachers. However, if we are to accomplish what President Hinckley has requested, the members living by faith and not by fear need to share the gospel 
with their friends and associates. In our individual callings, we need to have faith and not be fearful. Our daughter Catherine is serving as the primary president in her ward in Salt Lake City. My wife and I attended her ward last Sunday to observe the primary sacrament meeting presentation, I'll Follow Him in Faith. I was thrilled to hear the children recite scriptures and stories coupled with songs focused on faith in Christ. After the meeting, I asked her about her calling. She said that initially the calling weighed her down. Much time was spent going over problems. Then the presidency decided to emphasize love, faith, and prayer. Suddenly, spiritual impressions came to mind about a particular child or family. Friction was replaced with love. She tells me that as they acted upon promptings from the Spirit, primary reflected a reverence and peace and real gospel learning was taking place. It is our faith in Jesus Christ that sustains us at the crossroads of life's journey. It is the first principle of the gospel. Without it, we will spin our wheels at the intersection, spending our precious time but getting nowhere. It is Christ who offers the invitation to follow Him, to give Him our burden and to carry His yoke. For His yoke is easy and His burden is light. There is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved. We must take upon us His name and receive His image in our countenance so that when He comes, we will be more like Him. When we choose to follow Christ in faith rather than choosing another path out of fear, we are blessed with a consequence that is consistent with our choice. May we all recognize and give thanks for the incomparable gift of life we each enjoy and for the breath that He lends us daily. May we choose to have conviction at the crossroads of life and exercise faith in Jesus Christ. My prayer is that we will live by faith and not by fear. I bear my witness of God who is our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ who atoned for our sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. On September 23, 1995, the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles introduced to the Church and the world a document called The Family, a proclamation to the world. I quote from the paragraph which reads, Husband and wife have a solemn responsibility to love and care for each other and for their children. We live in a day and age in which this counsel is indeed very important. Many parents argue they don't have time for their families. The fast-paced lifestyle of modern-day life and excessive amounts of work are curbing parents' attention from what's most important, to give time, to give from oneself to one's family. The Lord taught us that every man has the responsibility to provide for his family, but it does not mean solely to store up the house with food and other items which are needed or desired. We must ha also have time to provide our family with teachings. What should we teach? Our Father has taught us that parents are obligated to teach the gospel to their children. The prophet Lehi understood well his responsibility to teach his children. Nephi declared that he had been taught in all the learning of his father. The Lord instructed us how to take care of our families when he told us through his prophets in the proclamation to the world, parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, to teaching them to love and serve one another, to observe the commandments of God, and to be law-abiding citizens wherever they live. We know God has taught us for centuries how to protect and take care of our families. We also know and can see that the adversary has been attacking the family. Now is the time to use all those teachings. Now is the time to perform our God-given duties concerning the family. President James E. Faust 
gave us three key things we can do to protect and strengthen our families. First, family prayer. Parents must teach their children that they are God's children and they, therefore, need to pray to Him daily. Second, family home evening. As President Faust taught us, family home evening is for all of us, no matter what stage in life we are in. We must have a Monday nights free of all other activities that might keep us from gathering as a family. Third, personal and family scripture study. We need to help our children strengthen their faith in testimony through this basic habit. As we follow President Faust's wise counsel, we will be protecting the family against Satan's attacks as well as strengthening their faith in testimony and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the family proclamation, we also learn that by divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness and are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. Mothers are primarily responsible for the nurture of their children. In these sacred responsibilities, fathers and mothers are obligated to help one another as equal partners. It is in the home that the family learns and applies gospel principles. Great love is necessary in order to teach and guide a family. Loving fathers and mothers will teach their children to worship God in their home. When a worshiping spirit permeates the home, that spirit is extended unto the lives of each family member. These will prepare them to do whatever sacrifice is necessary to be able to return to God's presence and stay together as a family for all eternity. The family proclamation helps us understand how much of the law of the Savior refers to when He told us we must love one another. He gave us the supreme example of love when He declared, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He later atoned for all our sins and finally gave his life for all of us. We can lay down our lives to those we love, not physically dying for them, but rather living for them, giving of our time, always being present in their lives, serving them, being courteous, affectionate, and showing true love for those of our family and to all men as the Savior taught. We don't know what could happen to us tomorrow, and that is why today is the time to start showing our love through small acts such as a hug and, and I love you to your wife and children and those around you. I recently read a text which expresses the urgency of not leaving for tomorrow what you can do today. In July of this year, Brazil witnessed the most devastating aircraft accident in its history. There were 199 people killed. The text I mentioned was said to have been posted on the airline communication board by the husband of one of the flight attendants who died in the accident. It is entitled, If Tomorrow Never Comes and is based upon a poem by Norma Cornet Marek. If I knew this would be the last time I would watch you sleep, I would hug you tighter. I would plead with the Lord to protect you. If I knew this would be the last time I saw you walk out the door, I would hug and kiss you and call you back to hug and kiss you one more time. If I knew this would be the last time I would hear your voice in prayer. I would record every gesture, every look, every smile, every one of your words, so that I could listen to it later, day after day. If I knew this would be the last time I would spend an extra minute or two to tell you I love you, instead of assuming you already knew it. If I knew this would be our last time, our last moment, I would be by your side, spending the day with you instead of thinking, well, I am sure other opportunities will come, so I can let this day go by. Of course, there will be a day to revise things, and we would have a second chance to do things right. Oh, 
Of course, there will be another day for us to say, I love you. And certainly, there will be another chance to tell each other, can I help with you anything? But in my case, that isn't one. I don't have you here with me. And today is the last day we have, our farewell. Therefore, I would like to say how much I love you. And I hope you never forget it. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone, young or old. Today might be your last chance to hold tight to the hand of the one you love and show all you feel. If you are waiting for tomorrow, why not do it today? Because if tomorrow never comes, you certainly will regret for the rest of your life not having spent some extra time for a smile, a conversation, a hug, a kiss, because you were too busy to give that person what ended up being their last wish. Then, hug tidy today the one you love, your friends, your family, and whisper in their ears how much you love them and want them close to you. Use your time to say, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Because if tomorrow never comes, you will not have to regret today. The past doesn't come back, and the future might not come. Let us express our love to our spouse and children, our brothers and sisters today. I know God lives. I know Jesus is the Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of the Lord, and that Gordon B. Hinckley is God's living prophet on this earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In the Book of Mormon, we read about 2,000 exemplary young men who were exceedingly valiant, courageous, and strong. They were men of truth and soberness, for they had been taught to keep the commandments of God and to walk uprightly before Him. These faithful young men paid tribute to their mothers. They said, Our mothers knew it. I would suspect that the mothers of Captain Moroni, Mosiah, Mormon, and other great leaders also knew. The responsibility mothers have today has never required more vigilance. More than at any time in the history of the world, we need mothers who know. Children are being born into a world where they wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. However, mothers need not fear. When mothers know who they are, who God is, and have made covenants with Him, they will have great power and influence for good on their children. Mothers who know desire to bear children. Whereas in many cultures in the world, children are becoming less valued, in the culture of the gospel, we still believe in having children. Prophets, seers, and revelators who were sustained at this conference have declared that God's commandment for His children to multiply and replenish the earth remains in force. President Ezra Taft Benson taught that young couples should not postpone having children, and that in the eternal perspective, Children, not possessions, not position, not prestige, are our greatest jewels. Faithful daughters of God desire children. In the scriptures we read of Eve, Sarah, Rebecca, and Mary, who were foreordained to be mothers before children were born to them. Some women are not given the responsibility of bearing children in mortality. But just as Hannah of the Old Testament prayed fervently for her child, the value women place on motherhood in this life and the attributes of motherhood they attain here will rise with them in the resurrection. Women who desire and work toward that blessing in this life are promised they will receive it for all eternity, and eternity is much, much longer than mortality. There is eternal influence and power in motherhood. Mothers who know honor sacred ordinances and covenants. 
I have visited sacrament meetings in some of the poorest places on the earth where mothers have dressed with great care in their Sunday best despite walking for miles on dusty streets and using worn out public transportation. They bring daughters in clean and iron dresses with hair brushed to perfection. Their sons wear white shirts and ties and have missionary haircuts. These mothers know they are going to sacrament meeting where covenants are renewed. These mothers have made and honored temple covenants. They know that if they are not pointing their children to the temple, they are not pointing them toward desired eternal goals. These mothers have influence and power. Mothers who know are nurturers. This is their special assignment and role under the plan of happiness. To nurture means to cultivate, care for, and make grow. Therefore, mothers who know create a climate for spiritual and temporal growth in their homes. Another word for nurturing is homemaking. Homemaking includes cooking, washing clothes and dishes, and keeping an orderly home. Home is where women have the most power and influence. Therefore, Latter-day Saint women should be the best homemakers in the world. Working beside children in homemaking tasks creates opportunities to teach and model qualities children should emulate. Nurturing mothers are knowledgeable, but all the education women attain will avail them nothing if they do not have the skill to make a home that creates a climate for spiritual growth. Growth happens best in a house of order, and women should pattern their homes after the Lord's house. Nurturing requires organization, patience, love, and work. Helping growth occur through nurturing is truly a powerful and influential role bestowed on women. Mothers who know are leaders. In equal partnership with their husbands, they lead a great and eternal organization. These mothers plan for the future of their organization. They plan for missions, temple marriages, and education. They plan for prayer, scripture study, and family home evening. Mothers who know build children into future leaders and are the primary examples of what leaders look like. They do not abandon their plan by succumbing to social pressure and worldly models of parenting. These wise mothers who know are selective about their own activities and involvement to conserve their limited strength in order to maximize their influence where it matters most. Mothers who know are always teachers. Since they are not babysitters, they are never off duty. A well-taught friend told me that he did not learn anything at church that he had not already learned at home. His parents used family scripture study, prayer, family home evening, meal times, and other gatherings to teach. Think of the power of our future missionary force if mothers considered their homes as a pre-missionary training center. Then the doctrines of the gospel taught in the MTC would be a review and not a revelation. That is influence. That is power. Mothers who know do less. They permit less of what will not bear good fruit eternally. They allow less media in their homes, less distraction, less activity that draws their children away from their home. Mothers who know are willing to live on less and consume less of the world's goods in order to spend more time with their children more time eating together, more time working together, more time reading together, more time talking, laughing, singing, and exemplifying. These mothers choose carefully and do not try to choose it all. Their goal is to prepare a rising generation of children who will take the gospel of Jesus Christ into the entire world. Their goal is to prepare future fathers and mothers who will be builders of the Lord's kingdom for the next 50 years. That is influence. That is power. Who will prepare this righteous generation of sons and daughters? Latter-day Saint women will do this, women who know and love the Lord and bear testimony of Him, women who are strong and immovable, who do not give up during difficult and discouraging times.
We are led by an inspired prophet of God who has called upon the women of the Church to stand strong and immovable for that which is correct and proper under the plan of the Lord. He has asked us to begin in our own homes to teach children the ways of truth. Latter-day Saint women should excel at upholding, nourishing, and protecting families. I have every confidence that our women will do this and will come to be known as mothers who knew. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This is the 177th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Everyone who will live the gospel of Jesus Christ daily and endure to the end will gain eternal life. This is the promise of the Lord. In its essentials, the gospel is simple and easy to understand and adapted to the capacity of the weakest. Elmer, the Book of Mormon prophet, aptly remarked, Now you may suppose that this is foolishness in me, but by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. And by very small means, the Lord doth confound the wise and bringeth about the salvation of many souls. Quite recently, I was privileged to observe this process in the life of a brother named Stan, who had been less active for some 45 years. He had lived a good life and supported both his wife and his son in their activity as faithful members in the Church. Yet, for personal reasons, he chose to remain outside the fellowship of the Church. Even so, each month he welcomed the home teachers. During February 2006, Stan received new home teachers. Their first visit was pleasant enough, although Stan showed no real interest in the Gospel or in any matters remotely associated with spiritual things. Their next visit did little to alter their initial observations, even though Stan was a little warmer and friendlier. On their third visit, however, there was a visible change in Stan's countenance and demeanor. To their utmost surprise, and even before they were able to present their message, Stan interrupted them with a number of thoughtful questions. In the ensuing discussion, he also recounted these experiences during the past month, in which he and his wife had commenced reading one chapter a day from the Book of Mormon. Elder Bruce R. McConkie eloquently described the type of reawakening Stan experienced. Here is a man who gains a copy of this blessed book begins to read it and continues until, having read it all, his famished soul is filled with the bread of life. He cannot lay it aside or ignore its teachings. It is as though the waters of life are flowing into the barren deserts of his soul, quenching the arid, empty feeling 
that theretofore separated him from his God. The home teachers were reminded of the remarkable power of the Book of Mormon and how very real the influence of the Spirit of the Lord is when we turn to its sacred pages. They also more fully understood the Prophet Joseph Smith's declaration that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Stan's thirst for learning and rediscovery of the gospel soon expanded his reading beyond one chapter a day, accompanied by deep soul-searching and fervent prayer. To those who sometimes are concerned whether the Lord will actually hear their prayers, the Savior reminds us, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts through the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Our beloved Prophet President Gordon Binkley also counseled, you can't do it alone. You need the help of the Lord. And the marvelous thing is that you have the opportunity to pray with the expectation that your prayers will be heard and answered. He stands ready to help. During August of 2006, Stan ventured alongside his ever faithful wife into his ward sacrament meeting, the first in 45 years. There, with a humble and prayerful heart, he listened to the simple sacramental prayers offered by the youthful priests. Feeling unworthy, and sensing something of the depth and the meaning of this most holy ordinance, he reflected deeply and painfully without partaking of the ward, a bread or the water for a number of weeks. President Joseph Fielding Smith, in attended testimony many years ago, said, In my judgment, the sacrament meeting is the most sacred, the most holy of all the meetings of the Church. When I reflect upon the gathering of the Savior and his apostles on that memorable night when he introduced the sacrament, my heart is filled with wonderment and my feelings are touched. I consider that gathering one of the most solemn and wonderful since the beginning of time. Stan continued studying, praying, attending church, and receiving appropriate counsel and encouragement from his home teachers. Then the day arrived when joyfully he felt he was ready to put forth his hand to partake of the precious sacrament. When we partake worthily, thoughtfully, and reverently of the Holy Sacrament, we are enabled to become partakers of the divine nature because of the atonement of Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost. As Stan returned to activity in the Church, he received a calling, and some months later he was ordained an elder. In July 2007, Stan and his wife knelt across the altar in a house of the Lord, and by the authority and eternal law of God, were married for time and for all eternity. Brothers and sisters, may we discover anew the divine power of daily prayer and the convincing influence of the Book of Mormon and the Holy Scriptures. On Sundays, when partaking of the sacrament, may we do so in the spirit of true devotion to Him who is the giver of all things. In the wake of our best and very limited efforts, and because of the Lord's infinite goodness, great things are brought to pass by the small and simple things. Finally, 
as to these sacred things, may I add my personal witness and assurance. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I have fond childhood memories of my mother reading Book of Mormon stories to me. She had a way of making the scriptural episodes come alive in my youthful imagination, and I did not doubt that my mother had a witness of the truthfulness of that sacred record. I especially remember her description of the Savior's visit to the American continent following his resurrection and of his teachings to the people in the Land of Bountiful. Through the simple consistency of her example and testimony, my mother kindled in me the first flames of faith in the Savior and in his Latter-day Church. I came to know for myself that the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ and contains the fullness of his everlasting gospel. Today I want to review with you one of my favorite Book of Mormon events, the Savior's appearance in the New World, and discuss his instruction to the multitude about the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. I pray for the guidance of the Spirit for me and for you. During the Lord's three-day ministry in the New World, he taught his doctrine, authorized his disciples to perform priesthood ordinances, healed the sick, prayed for the people, and lovingly blessed the children. As the Savior's time with the people was drawing to a close, he succinctly summarized the fundamental principles of his gospel. Said he, now this is the commandment, repent all ye ends of the earth and come unto me and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. The basic principles outlined by the Master in this scripture are essential for us to understand and to apply in our lives. First was repentance a turning of the heart and will to God, and a renunciation of sin. As we appropriately seek for and receive the spiritual gift of faith in the Redeemer, we then turn to and rely upon the merits, the mercy, and the grace of the Holy Messiah. Repentance is the sweet fruit that comes from faith in the Savior and involves turning toward God and away from sin. The risen Lord next explained the importance of coming unto him. The multitude gathered together at the temple was invited literally to come forth unto the Savior one by one, to feel the prints of the nails in the Master's hands and feet, and to thrust their hands into his side. Each individual who had this experience did know of a surety and did bear record that it was he, even Jesus Christ, who had come. The Savior also taught the people to come unto him through sacred covenants, and he reminded them that they were the children of the covenant. He emphasized the eternal importance of the ordinances of baptism and of receiving the Holy Ghost. In a similar manner, you and I are admonished to turn toward and learn from Christ and to come unto him through the covenants and ordinances of his restored gospel. As we do so, we will eventually and ultimately come to know him in his own time and in his own way and according to his own will, as did the people in the land of Bountiful. Repenting and coming unto Christ through the covenants and ordinances of salvation are prerequisite to and a preparation for being sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost and standing spotless before God at the last day. I now want to focus our attention upon the sanctifying influence the Holy Ghost can be in our lives. The gate of baptism leads to the straight and narrow path and to the destination of putting off the natural man and becoming a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. The purpose of our mortal journey is not merely to see the sights on earth or to expend our allotment of time on self-centered pursuits. Rather, we are to walk in newness of life to become sanctified by yielding our hearts unto God 
and to obtain the mind of Christ. We are commanded and instructed to so live that our fallen nature is changed through the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. President Marion G. Romney taught that the baptism of fire by the Holy Ghost, quote, converts us from carnality to spirituality. It cleanses, heals, and purifies the soul. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, and water baptism are all preliminary and prerequisite to it, but the baptism of fire is the consummation. To receive this baptism of fire is to have one's garments washed in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ." Close quote. Hence, as we are born again and strive to always have His Spirit to be with us, the Holy Ghost sanctifies and refines our souls as if by fire. Ultimately, we are to stand spotless before God. The gospel of Jesus Christ encompasses much more than avoiding, overcoming, and being cleansed from sin and the bad influences in our lives. It also essentially entails doing good, being good, and becoming better. Repenting of our sins and seeking forgiveness are spiritually necessary, and we must always do so. But remission of sin is not the only or even the ultimate purpose of the gospel. To have our hearts changed by the Holy Spirit such that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually, as did King Benjamin's people, is the covenant responsibility we have accepted. This mighty change is not simply the result of working harder or developing greater individual discipline. Rather, it is the consequence of a fundamental change in our desires, our motives, and our natures made possible through the Atonement of Christ the Lord. Our spiritual purpose is to overcome both sin and the desire to sin, both the taint and the tyranny of sin. Prophets throughout the ages have emphasized the dual requirements of one, avoiding and overcoming bad, and two, doing good and becoming better. Consider the penetrating questions posed by the psalmist. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Brothers and sisters, it is possible for us to have clean hands but not have a pure heart. Please notice that both clean hands and a pure heart are required to ascend into the hill of the Lord and to stand in His holy place. Let me suggest that hands are made clean through the process of putting off the natural man and by overcoming sin and the evil influences in our lives through the Savior's Atonement. Hearts are purified as we receive His strengthening power to do good and become better. All of our worthy desires and good works, as necessary as they are, can never produce clean hands and a pure heart. It is the Atonement of Jesus Christ that provides both a cleansing and redeeming power that helps us to overcome sin and a sanctifying and strengthening power that helps us to become better than we ever could by relying only upon our own strength. The infinite Atonement is for both the sinner and for the saint in each of us. In the Book of Mormon, we find the masterful teachings of King Benjamin concerning the mission and atonement of Jesus Christ. The simple doctrine he taught caused the congregation to fall to the earth, for the fear of the Lord had come upon them, and they viewed themselves in their own carnal state, even less than the dust of the earth. And they all cried aloud with one voice, saying, O oh, have mercy! and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, 
who shall come down among the children of men. Again in this verse, we find the twofold blessing of both forgiveness of sin, suggesting clean hands, and the transformation of our nature, signifying pure hearts. As King Benjamin concluded his instruction, he reiterated the importance of these two basic aspects of spiritual development. And now for the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, that is, for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that ye may walk guiltless before God, I would that ye should impart of your substance to the poor. Our sincere desire should be to have both clean hands and a pure heart both a remission of sins from day to day and to walk guiltless before God. Clean hands alone will not be enough when we stand before Him who is pure and who as a lamb without blemish and without spot freely spilled His precious blood for us. Some who hear or read this message may think the spiritual progress I am describing is not attainable in their lives. We may believe these truths apply to others, but not to us. We will not attain a state of perfection in this life, but we can and should press forward with faith in Christ along the straight and narrow path and make steady progress toward our eternal destiny. The Lord's pattern for spiritual development is line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little small, steady, incremental spiritual improvements are the steps the Lord would have us take. Preparing to walk guiltless before God is one of the primary purposes of mortality and the pursuit of a lifetime. It does not result from sporadic spurts of intense spiritual activity. I witness that the Savior will strengthen and assist us to make sustained, paced progress. The example in the Book of Mormon of many, exceedingly great many, in the ancient Church who were pure and spotless before God is a source of encouragement and great comfort to me. I suspect those members of the ancient Church were ordinary men and women just like you and me. These individuals could not look upon sin save it were with abhorrence, and they were made pure and entered into the rest of the Lord their God. And these principles and this process of spiritual progress apply to each of us equally and always. The requirement to put off the natural man and become a saint, to avoid and overcome bad and to do and become good, to have clean hands and a pure heart is a recurring theme throughout the Book of Mormon. In fact, Moroni's concluding invitation at the end of the book is a summary of this theme. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in Him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you that by His grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father, unto the remission of your sins, that ye become holy without spot. May you and I repent with sincerity of heart and truly come unto Christ. I pray that we will seek through the Savior's Atonement to have both clean hands and a pure heart, that we may become holy without spot. I witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Eternal Father and our Savior. He who is without spot redeems us from sin and strengthens us to do good and to become better. I so testify in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
The choir has just sung, God So Loved the World. We express our thanks to the choir for the beautiful music which they've provided. Following my remarks, this session will conclude with the choir singing How Firm a Foundation. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Wolfgang H. Paul of the Seventy, and the concluding session of the conference will begin at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Now, my brothers and sisters, we live in an interesting phenomenon. A soloist sings the same song again and again. An orchestra repeats the same music. But a speaker is expected to come up with something new every time he speaks. <laughs> I've spoken some 200 times in general conference. I'm going to break the tradition this morning and repeat in a measure what I have said on another occasion. The Church has become one large family scattered across the earth. There are now more than 13 million of us in 176 nations and territories. A marvelous and wonderful thing is coming to pass. The Lord is fulfilling His promise that His gospel shall be as the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, which would roll forth and fill the whole earth, as Daniel saw in vision. A great miracle is taking place right before our eyes. I take you back 184 years to the year 1823, the month was September, the night of September 21, 22 to be exact. The boy Joseph Smith had prayed that night before going to sleep. He asked the Lord for forgiveness of his light-mindedness. A miraculous thing then happened. He says, while I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside. He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God, that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. The boy must have been stunned by what he heard. In the eyes of those who knew him, he was simply a poor, unlearned farm boy. He had no wealth. His neighbors were in the same condition. His parents were struggling farmers. The area where they lived was rural and largely unknown. They were simply ordinary people trying to survive through hard work. And yet an angel of God said that Joseph's name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues. How could it be? That description fits the entire world. Now, as we look back 177 years to the organization of the Church, we marvel at what has already happened. When the Church was organized in 1830, there were but six members, only a handful of believers, all residing in a largely unknown village. Today, we have become the fourth or fifth largest church in North America, with congregations in every city of any consequence. Stakes of Zion today flourish in every state of the United States. 
in every province of Canada, in every state of Mexico, in every nation of Central America, and throughout South America. Congregations are found throughout the British Isles and Europe, where thousands have joined the Church through the years. This work has reached out to the Baltic nations and on down through Bulgaria and Albania and other areas of that part of the world. It reaches across the vast area of Russia. It reaches up into Mongolia and all down through the nations of Asia, into the islands of the Pacific, Australia and New Zealand, and into India and Indonesia. It is flourishing in many of the nations of Africa. Our general conferences are carried by satellite and other means in 92 different languages, and this is only the beginning. This work will continue to grow and prosper and move across the earth. It must do so if Moroni's promise to Joseph is to be fulfilled. This work is unique and wonderful. It is fundamentally different from every other body of religious doctrine of which I know. When Jesus walked the earth, he said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Joseph, when he was 14 years of age, had an experience in that glorious first vision that was different from any other recorded experience of any man at no other time of which we have any record have God our eternal Father and his beloved Son, the risen Lord, appeared on earth together. At the time of the baptism of Jesus by John in the River Jordan, the voice of God was heard, but he was not seen. At the Mount of Transfiguration, again the voice of God was heard, but there is no record of his appearance. Stephen saw the Lord on the right hand of the Father, but they did not address or instruct him. Following his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the Nephites in the Western Hemisphere. The voice of the Almighty was heard three times, introducing the risen Christ, but there was no appearance of the Father. How truly remarkable, then, was that vision in the year 1820, when Joseph prayed in the woods and there appeared before him both the Father and the Son. One of these spoke to him, calling him by name, and pointing to the other said, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Nothing like it had ever happened before. One is led to wonder why it was so important that both the Father and the Son appear. I think it was because they were ushering in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the last and final dispensation of the gospel, when there would be gathered together in one the elements of all previous dispensations. This was to be the final chapter in the long chronicle of God's dealings with men and women upon the earth. Following the Savior's death, the church he had established drifted into apostasy. Fulfilled were the words of Isaiah, who had said, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenants. Realizing the importance of knowing the true nature of God, men had struggled to find a way to define him. Learned clerics argued with one another. When Constantine became a Christian in the fourth century, he called together a great convocation 
of learned men with the hope that they could reach a conclusion of understanding concerning the true nature of deity. All they reached was a compromise of various points of view. The result was the Nicene Creed of 325 AD. This and subsequent creeds have become the declaration of doctrine concerning the nature of deity for most of Christianity ever since. I have read them all a number of times. I cannot understand them. I think others cannot understand them. I am sure that the Lord also knew that many would not, under not understand them. And so in 1820, in that incomparable vision, the Father and the Son appeared to the boy Joseph. They spoke to him with words that were audible, and he spoke to them. They could see, they could speak, they could hear. They were personal. They were of substance. They were not imaginary beings. They were beings tabernacled in flesh. And out of that experience has come our unique and true understanding of the nature of deity. <clears throat> no wonder that when Joseph in 1842 wrote the Articles of Faith, he stated as number one, we believe in God the Eternal Father and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. As all of you well know, there followed through the years a veritable cloud of witnesses, as Paul described prophetically. First came Moroni with the plates from which were translated the Book of Mormon. What a singular and remarkable thing this was. Joseph's story of the gold plates was fantastic. It was hard to believe and easy to challenge. Could he have written it of his own capacity? It is here, my brothers and sisters, for everyone to handle, to read. Every attempt to explain its origin, other than that which he gave, has fallen of its own weight. He was largely unschooled, and yet in a very brief time, he brought forth the translation, which in published form comes to more than 500 pages. Paul declares that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The Bible had stood for centuries. It is a precious and wonderful book. Now there was a second witness declaring the divinity of Christ. The Book of Mormon is the only book ever published of which I know that carries in it a promise that one who reads it prayerfully and asks concerning it in prayer will have revealed to him by the power of the Holy Ghost a knowledge that it is true. Since its first publication in a rural print shop in Palmyra, New York, there have been more than 133 million copies produced. It has been translated into 105 languages. Not long ago, it was named one of the 20 most influential books ever published in North America. Recently, a first edition sold for $105,000, but the cheapest paperback edition is as valuable to the reader who loves its language and message. Through all of these years, critics have tried to explain it. They've spoken against it. They have ridiculed it, but it has outlived them all and its influence today is greater than at any time in its history. In this series of events came next the restoration of the priesthood, 
bestowed by resurrected beings who held it when the Savior walked the earth. This occurred in 19, 1829, when Joseph was only 23. Following receipt of the priesthood, the church was organized on the 6th of April, 1830, when Joseph was a young man, not yet 25. Again, the organization is unique and different from that of traditional Christianity. It is largely operated by a lay ministry. Voluntary service is its genius. It has grown and spread apart. Thousands upon thousands of faithful and able men have directed its efforts. Today, I stand in wonder at the marvelous things which God revealed to his appointed prophet while he was yet young and largely unknown. The very language of these revelations is beyond the capacity of even a man of great learning, scholars not of our faith, who will not accept our singular doctrines, are puzzled by the great unrolling of this work which is touching the hearts of people across the earth. We are all at all to the Joseph the prophet, the seer and the revelator, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is foreordained to come forth in this generation as an instrument in the hands of the Almighty in restoring to the earth that which the Savior taught when he walked the roads of Palestine. To you, each of you this day, I affirm my witness of the calling of the prophet Joseph, of his works, of the sealing of his testimony with, the, with his blood as a marvel to the eternal truth. Each of you can bear witness of the same thing. You and I are faced with a stark question of accepting the truth of the first vision and that which followed it. On the question of its reality lies the very validity of this church. If it is truth, and I testify that it is, then the work in which we are engaged is the most important work on the earth. I leave with you my testimony of the truth of these things and I invoke the blessings of heaven upon you. May the windows of heaven be opened and blessings showered upon you as the Lord promised. Never forget that this was his promise and that he has the power and the capacity to see that it is fulfilled. I so pray as I leave my blessing and love with you in the sacred name of our Redeemer, even the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Our beloved Heavenly Father, at the conclusion of this historic session of General Conference, we humbly express our gratitude unto Thee that we felt Thy Spirit as we listened to the wonderful music and were taught and counseled by Thy servants. We pray, Father, that we may have the desire and the determination to apply the principles which we are taught in our daily lives. We are grateful for the knowledge we have that we are thy sons and daughters, and we are so grateful for thy love and continuing support. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for thy beloved Son, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and his atoning sacrifice for us. We are grateful for the prophet Joseph Smith and for the restoration of the gospel in these latter days, for the living prophet, prophet we have today, President Hinckley, for his noble counselors, President Monson, President Eyring, for the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, whom we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. We pray for them and their families. We pray that thy glorious work may fill the earth and that all those who have the desire to hear thy word may hear it. We give thanks unto thee, Father, for all thy blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 177th Semiannual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Communications. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.